Welcome to Hoko Palizzo's The Writing Life. I'm Grace Cavalieri. Our guest is Carolyn Forche. Every poet in the country knows the name Carolyn Forche because she has galvanized human rights within our poetry culture. Carolyn, what is poetry of witness? A term I believe you brought to consciousness. Uh, poetry of Witness arises out of my uh, struggle with the cyclical argument about the poet and the state and poetry and politics and what the poet's responsibility is to civil society and so on. After I returned from El Salvador and wrote a controversial second book, which was controversial because it had poems that arose out of experiences in El Salvador, this debate flared again in the public imagination and Poetry of Witness was a, was a discovery, a way of making a space between the intimacies of the domestic sphere and the hearth, the, the sphere that lyric poetry is comfortable in and the sphere that actually epic poetry is comfortable in, which is the sphere of, pol of the polis, of politics and of the institutions of the state. And what I wanted was a kind of space between them, a social space where we publish books and have debates and have public discussions and write literature and make art. And this is between, somewhere between the institutions of the state and personal life. And for me, one is not a poet of witness. It isn't really an identity. It's a way of reading the work of poets who have endured extremity, who's it creative imagination has been marked by intense suffering, usually collectively born, like the experience of warfare, for instance. Carolyn Forche, though, you are a poet who is an activist, who is a great literary figure, and I'm going to tell everyone your credentials. You have several books of poems of your own. They are The Blue Hour, The Angel of History, The Country Between Us, Gathering the Tribes, I have to say that every one of these books has won a national award. She is also the editor of Against Forgetting, 20th Century Poetry of Witness, and the co-editor of Poetry of Witness, The Tradition in English, 1500 to almost the present day. We're going to be talking about that soon. If I were to say all of your awards, we'd be up late. I will just say your honors include fellowships from the Guggenheim, the Lannan Foundation, NEA, and you have received the Charity Randall Citation from the International Poetry Forum. Most recently, Carolyn Forche received the Academy of American Poets Fellowship given for Distinguished poet Poetic Achievement. Distinguished Poetic Achievement. You make it sound scary. <laughs> that sounds, it, it, by um, our Chancellor of the Academy of American Poets, so I think that's a very important award. Carolyn is now the Lannan Chair in Poetry at Georgetown University in Washington. I am going to pick up this book and hold it in my hand because it is Poetry of Witness, your recent production, The Tradition in English Poetry from 1500 to almost present day, 2001. What did you hope this book would do? <laughs> what did you want from this? I have to give credit to my co-editor, Duncan Wu, my colleague at Georgetown, who is a wonderful romantic scholar. And when I joined the faculty at Georgetown, we both joined around the same time, and he was very excited about Against Forgetting and Poetry mm -hmm. of Witness. It's and he said, um, He said, you know, I bet we could read back through our own tradition and find many, many poets who had themselves experienced these kinds of things, the military occupation, house arrest, imprisonment, and so on. And he said, let's do it, and let's start with 1500 and let's read all the way to the present. And I thought, because I had this myth about poetry, it's 
you know, the ivory tower, more or less, mostly. And I found out that, no, actually, often it was the Tower of London and not the ivory tower so at true. all. Right. So we, we went through, and I found, to my surprise, really, that most of the significant poets of the past five centuries uh, had themselves uh, gone through very um, difficult times. And if you read two pages a day, you would know the history of English poetry think so. in a year's time, even though it is seen through a particular lens of social justice and activism. But what does it take to start a project like this the scope of it, I mean, how do you even begin the research and make the selections, and how long did it take? Um, it took, I think this one was about three years, which is, the first one was 13 years, so we got be it got better. Mm -hmm. But this, um, you begin by trying to identify uh, the poets who lived in certain times you know, during, for example, in England, the civil wars and um, in Ireland under, under oppression over certain centuries and so on. So we, we began to look for the poets who wrote in those times and then to research their lives. And when we found, uh, in most cases, we found a reason to include their work. And then you begin to read the work to see what happened. What I read for is the impress of extremity that mark the way that if you put your thumb into wax you know and you leave a print I believe that that endurance of extremity leaves a print mm. on the work itself mm. on the language on the poetic imagination endurance of extremity yes so this is what I was reading for and so we tried to collect the poems that were most exemplary of that and you begin in 1500 and so will you share with the audience the very first poem in this book and that is Sir Thomas More, who was put to death by Henry VIII yes. for being Catholic. Yes. And w it, even though he's in the Tower of London, and even though he's about to die, he can write a right. poem. This, in fact, we chose to publish one of the poems written uh, when he was awaiting I death. I think one day before. Davy the Dicer, one day before. Um, Davy the Dicer. Long was I, Lady Locke, your serving man. And now I have lost again all that I got. Wherefore, when I think on you now and then, and in my mind remember this or that, you may not blame me, though I beshrew your cat, but in, faithless, in faith I bless you again a thousand times for lending me now some leisure to make rhymes. Imagine. He's thanking, he's thanking his fortune that he has Good a few more minutes to write. To write. Right. And with chalk. Yes. I think right. with charcoal on the charcoal wall. Charcoal on the wall. So I want yeah. to say that the two essays that begin this are truly worth reading. Thank you, you write one, and Duncan Wu, your professor yes. at Georgetown, mm -hmm. writes the other. Yes. They have a fantastic context. I think this should be in every classroom, and I hope it is. So it goes all the way to 2001, Aga Shahid Ali, who was um, from Kashmir. Kashmir, yes. He was a Kashmir-American poet. Um, he died of cancer several years ago. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't, I lose track of the time, but he was, a, he was actually a, f a friend hmm. and known to many, many American poets. In fact, he got us all writing guzzles. He brought back the Urdu form oh, guzzles, and that's form. why you see so many guzzles in contemporary poetry now. He was responsible? It was him, yes. He brought, he brought the form. He revived it. I didn't know that. Yeah, That's it was really wonderful. Well, this is um, a very important book, and we will learn the history of English poetry if we own this book. I think that is very important. Um, I want to hark from the present to your very beginning. Oh. And this is Gathering the Tribes. It's such a little book, <laughs> so thin to have so much power and intensity and passion chosen by Stanley Kunitz, 1976, Yale series of younger poets, and launched you. These books were written during college, right? Um, yes, during college. I started, I think the oldest poem in there was written when I was 19. How do you describe this book? Well, it's a, it's a young woman's uh, quest book. She's on a journey, and she's very rooted in her, I'm talking about myself in third person, I was rooted in my uh, Czechoslovak heritage and raised by my 
paternal grandmother, Anna, partly because she would live with us and I was so enchanted by her. And, um, and I think the household was in some ways Eastern European because of her presence. And, and so she's there, but I, I, then I found her in other communities. I found another, after she died in 1968, and another friend of mine died, I went out to explore the American West, the mountains of the Pacific South, um, Northwest and also the Southwest. And in the Southwest, I met a woman from the Taos Pueblo, Yaquana, and she was so like Anna that I felt like I had Anna back briefly. And so she, there are poems about her also. It's a very strong book about your own identity. Do you recognize the speaker in this book? I'm, I, I hope I'm fond of her. <laughs> she continues on. I find the same passion and intensity and sense of identity that goes forward into your other books. It is all there. You come from Russian and Czechoslovakian background? Um, well, they were from Czechoslovakia, but it, they were all part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire at that time. So there were Hungarian and, and um, Mold, Moldovian, Moldovian. And they, they were escaping, not, your grandmother escaped Nazi no, Germany? No, my grandmother came prior to the Nazi in, in mm -hmm. invasion of Czechoslovakia. She came through Ellis Island mm. and in the early part of the 20th century. And her parents also came, but then went back. It's a long family story, so we're, we're just unearthing everything now. However, it's but, all here. Yes. Your heritage is so embedded in every line. And to honor her, let us hear a poem, which is a very famous poem of yours, well anthologized. The Morning Baking. Oh, so I missed her. She died in 1968. And she was, I believe, 88 when she died. I should have been expecting it, but I wasn't. Oh, you never can expect it. No. The morning baking. Grandma, come back. I forgot how much lard for these rolls. Think you can put yourself in the ground like plain potatoes and grow in Ohio? <laughs> I am damn sick of getting fat like you. Think you can lie through your Slovak, tell filthy stories about the blood sausage, pish pish nights at the Virgin in Detroit. I blame your raising me up for my Slav tongue. You beat me up out back, taught me to dance. I'll tell you, I don't remember any kind of bread. Your wavy loaves of flesh stink through my sleep, the stars on your silk robes. But I'm glad I'll look when I'm old, like a gypsy dusha hauling milk. I That's think that Anna, was a young, right? Young poem. Yes. That is Anna. And Tell us just a little bit more about her, because oh. she has permeated your life so much, and you've looked for her in so many women. She bore 10 children. Five of them survived to adulthood. She had a farm during the Depression in Ohio. My father was her second youngest child. She was um, uh, peripatetic. She wandered all over the place. It's it said in my family there's always one woman who wanders and I'm supposed to be that one now because I travel so much, they say. But um, she was uh, very hardworking, a farm woman, really. But she also loved opera, and a member of her family was singing in Vienna when I was growing up, and so she was always and talking. And now she has, she's immortal, <laughs> yes. because we will die, yeah. but she will be she's forever still in that book. Yeah. She will always be in that book. Preserving the beloved. I hope so. I um, spoke to a young woman poet and said I was going to speak to you today. And I said, what would you like me to ask Carolyn Forche? And she said, well, how did her journey begin? And I thought that was so startling because all of us know your journey. But I thought, no, these are young. This is a new generation of Carolyn Forcheers. They really know your, of your poetry. They know some of your poetry. They don't know the details. Tell us about going down to Latin America, what happened there, and what books came from that initially. Oh, okay. Well, I had been writing since I was nine years old. So all of the poets who grew up writing 
in their little notebooks. This is how it starts. It starts when you're a kid often. But, and that started in a snowstorm when my mother gave me the assignment because I was snowed in from school to write. And I sat down and wrote my first poem. Years later, I was translating a woman poet, Clarivella Alegria. It was a project I took on when I was having trouble after gathering the tribes with my own poems. I wasn't writing and I was worried, so I began, one of the reasons I began this translation project was that I, it was something I could do. It would lead me back into poetry. And I wanted to make an English translation of Clarivella's poems she, because she had never been translated into English before mostly because a lot of the translators at the time weren't translating women. No. No. And she was exiled, wasn't she? She was, well, she was living in voluntary exile from El Salvador. Mm -hmm. She had written a thinly disguised novel um, that uh, displeased the ruling oligarchs in El Salvador. And so she, she, when I met her, she was living in Spain. And I spent a summer with her in 1977 in Mallorca with her daughter and we worked on the poems together and I learned a great deal that summer about what was going on not only in El Salvador and Central America in general but also in Argentina and Chile. This was the time of the dirty wars and and Latin America was under most of it under brutal military dictatorship at that time so the writers were profoundly engaged many of them in exile and when I went back to my teaching post in California, uh, I was visited by a member of Clarivelle's family. He'd heard about me, and, he, and he'd read the poetry book, Gathering the Tribes. And he came to visit me to ask me if I would be willing to come to El Salvador, because war was coming. And he thought, a poet should see this. And if a poet from the United States sees this and knows how to talk about it after it begins, uh, she will have an effect in the United States because he believed that poetry was profoundly um, important and influential. And I had to explain to him that U.S. Americans don't um, aren't necessarily influenced by their poets. You <laughs> changed <Alaska>. that. You <laughs> changed that. But he uh, asked me to come, and I'd just gotten a Guggenheim Fellowship. Right. And so I was able to accept his invitation and... Um, I'm working on a memoir right now oh. about the, that time, uh, about the invitation, about answering that doorbell. And then, and then you were doing human rights work. In El Salvador, uh, as I, when I arrived there, the events he thought were two years away had already begun. It was the time of the death squads. So I began writing to Amnesty International London Secretariat, International Secretariat in London, and I began to also write to other human rights organizations and kept gathering material and got to know people chiefly who were associated with the church, with YSAX, which was Monsignor Romero's radio station, and with his hmm. human rights office. And I made friends. And it was a little bit like being at a house that's burning. And there you was stay. danger. There was danger. But you don't leave. You saw Be a you, lot. You get, you, 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 you just feel that you can't leave. It's like a war correspondent. I suppose they also have this, yeah. They do, they do. I mean, my husband worked for time for some decades in wars. and uh, but, but in the end, in 1980, in March, Monsignor Romero uh, told me that I, I should leave right away. There were a lot of problems, and I had had some problems. And I tried to persuade him to stay, uh, to, to leave also, to, you know, and he, he insisted I leave. Mm -hmm. So we had this discussion. Mm -hmm. and, well, yeah. from this came the country between, between us. us right. And uh, this, I taught this book. Thank a you. A very important book. Mm -hmm. And it is extremely painful. Yes. I think there's one or two poems here that everyone knows. But I was going to ask you to read just a short one, The Visitor, mm -hmm. because it captures the menacing, and, and yet you are so subtle, and you have such a light hand upon the horrific things. I wanted to show that. And then a little bit of a very long poem, because we will get the taste of the experience of what you are capturing almost as a journalist and a poet. Um, 
it's painful mostly for Salvadorans um, and continues to be that period. This was for a man I visited in a prison in Ahuachapan. The visitor, in Spanish, he whispers, there is no time left. It is the sound of scythes arcing in wheat, the ache of some field song in Salvador, the wind along the prison cautious as Francisco's hands on the inside, touching the walls as he walks. It is his wife's breath slipping into his cell each night while he imagines his hand to be hers. It is a small country. There is nothing one man will not do to another. You know, that is a very small poem, and yet there is quite a life encased in that. His hands touch the walls as he walks, his wife's breath. I mean, that might be like 14, that might be a 10-line poem. But yeah. look what is in it. And a very long poem of yours, which we won't be able to read ourselves or nothing, but maybe you could just set it up in one sentence and then just read from the last line here to the ending of the poem, which again captures your vigilance and and the fact you were in danger all of the time and witnessing very painful things. But when, it be, when it's transformed to poetry, it becomes beautiful. Make it clear and it becomes beautiful. So we'd love to hear this. This was written for Terence Dupre, who was a scholar who wrote the book, The Survivor and Anatomy of Life in the Death Camps. And um, this book was about the, the people who survived the Nazis and the Soviet Gulag. And so I, I'm addressing this poem to him. In the mass graves, a woman's hand caged in the ribs of her child. Mm. A single stone in Spain beneath olives. In Germany, the silent windy fields. In the Soviet Union, where the snow is scarred with wire. In Salvador, where the blood will never soak into the ground. Everywhere and always, go after that which is lost. Mm. There is a cyclone fence between ourselves and the slaughter and behind it, we hover in a calm, protected world, like netted fish, exactly like netted fish. It is either the beginning or the end of the world, and the choice is ourselves or nothing. You knock me out, Carol. You knock Thank me you. out. The beauty, uh, from the pain, the beauty, I can't get over what it is, the transcendence from the horrors to the beauty. I'd like to go to a recent book of yours, which is very different in line lengths. It yeah. is very different in tone. Yes. And I love this book. Oh, thank it's you. meditative. It's like a dream. It is, has all of the menacing of your other work enfolded in it, but it is very different in its sensibility. And it has a more relaxed line. It is more, um, I, there's one poem I consider equal to Howell in here. And it is J. Craft, let's see, what is it called? Decryptage? Decryptage? Th this one is the on earth poem, the uh, abecedary, the long poem. Yes, yes. We're not going to read all of no. that. No. But isn't. But isn't it amazing how you begin every stanza with a different, yeah. a different letter and follow every line with that letter? However, there is a very beautiful poem here. I'd like to leave the program with our audience hearing this poem, okay. Prayer. Um, this was written around the time of the first um, Gulf War. Mm -hmm. Prayer, begin again among the poorest, moments off in another time and place. Belongings gathered in the last hour, visible, invisible. Tin spoon, teacup, tremble of tray, carpet hanging from sorrow's balcony. Say goodbye to everything. With a wave of your hand, gesture to all you have known. Begin with bread torn from bread, 
beans given to the hungriest, a carcass of flies. Take the polished stillness from a locked church, prayer notes left between stones. Answer them and hoist in your net voices from the troubled hours. Sleep only when the least among them sleeps, and then only until the birds. Make the flatbed truck your time and place. Make the least daily wage your value. Language will rise then like language from the mouth of a still river. No one's mouth. Bring night to your imaginings. Bring the darkest passage. This book is a very important book to me because it's a different facet of Carolyn Forche. Do you agree? I think these books were all 10 years apart. So That's right. I, they're all a different think, dimension of you. I think they're all different Carolyn Forches as I per proceeded through life. But this is almost a meditative book, yeah, and I, meditative. I love it Thank very you. much. Carolyn, finally, um, no time in history is like any other time. But as we look at the tumult today and the terrible horrors we're watching, what can poetry do or what does poetry continue to do? It's been said that poetry is the natural prayer of the human soul. I think people turn to it in times like these. There's a strong resurgence of interest in poetry in the United States. I feel it everywhere I go. I think uh, there have been poets for millennia that if we have any future as, a, as for humankind, poetry will be there with us, accompanying us. I, I agree with you, we're in very difficult times. Thank you very much, Carolyn, for Thank being you. with us this afternoon. Thank you we for are so me. happy to be with you. Thank you. Thank you for watching The Writing Life. This has been a production of Hoco Palizzo and Howard Community College. I'm Grace Cavalieri. <laughs>